<laughs> Welcome to the Man Cave, the only podcast hosted by two best friends with nothing in common except their first names. I'm Mandy Kaplan. I'm Mandy Fabian. And every week we test the limits of our friendship, arguing over movies and television series and books and podcasts and all of Mandy's dumb ideas. Grab a couch. Let's get to it. Cut this shit. I want to talk about earworms. Oh, God. Okay. Like literal because earworms or the kinds like songs that get stuck in your head? So, songs that get stuck in your head. Okay. D- because good. it's me. Hi. Yeah. I'm the problem. It's me. Okay. Wow. That's big of you. I've never heard you say those words. 20 years of friendship. Tea time. Everybody agrees. You're, you don't know Taylor Swift's antihero. I do. It's yeah. me. Oh, hi. I see. Mm -hmm. I'm the problem. It's me. Oh, yeah. I thought you were just saying that you're the problem. Yeah, okay. Why would I say that? (laughs) When clearly I'm delightful. Right, yeah. Well, it it plays all the time. My car does this awesome thing where when you're listening to something, it notifies you that one of your favorite songs is playing on a different channel. Oh. So we will, every day, we are listening to Antihero and it's like, Antihero is playing on another channel. Antihero is playing on another channel. I'm like, while we're already listening to it, it's crazy. And then there's a new one. Have you heard Megan Trainers Made You Look? No. So this song is like uh, all about the bass, the sequel. Okay. It gets in your brain and it doesn't go oh. away. And it's very like that same like, Walla, 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 I made you look. Uh, 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 uh. Yeah. It's so cute and harmonized, and I <gasps> dig it so hard. And it's body positive, and I love Megan Trainer, and I love Taylor Swift, and that is what I've been doing every day of this holiday season, besides watching everybody around me get sick and cancel plans. What have you been doing? <laughs> my coffee <laughs> oh my god you really yeah that was like a that was like a disneyland for song lovers what you just i i taylor swift is when you said earworm i i literally that was the first name that popped into my head because she i can't get her out of my head that that album folklore i thought was one of the best albums i've ever heard uh her new th- album's great did you get yeah did you get tickets are you gonna go see are you gonna be a swifty on august 5th <sighs> Get tickets. Oh, my God. Our whole family. How many people do you have to murder to get tickets? No, we, we our whole family signed up to be pre verified pre-fans. You have to, like, give them your name and your email and your bank accounts and mm-hmm. and your the your grades. Yeah, I had to get a transcript from my high school. Like, it's a big yeah. deal. Anyway, we all do- dove in and then just in hopes that one of us would get the opportunity to buy tickets. And my niece in Oklahoma... Made it. They were like, quick, quick, quick. You've got like an hour. You better buy your tickets now. And she got uh, she got tickets. So we're going for to Taylor all of Swift. You? Well, in you, Oklahoma? No, no, no. She if she oh. bought the ones for Los Angeles. And she, oh, I she see. could only buy six. We have six precious Taylor Swift tickets. Wow. God damn, right? Say that yep. 50 times, five times fast. Um, but I uh, mean, I would love to see Taylor Swift, but we, I'm not going to work that hard. Can I tell you a funny earworm story? Yeah, it'd be funnier if I could remember which song it was. But you know how folklore is pretty like sad. It's got a yes. lot of like we were. <laughs> is so... that Champagne Problems? Is that that record Willow and Champagne Problems, or is it? I think Champagne Problems probably is that. I don't. I honestly don't remember. I don't okay. know any of the names. It's like the one about I, you're like an old cardigan. You yeah. put me on in Miami, your mm-hmm. favorite. So that one of yep. those, oh yeah, I knew you dancing on the weekend, giving me a thing and I, you know that song? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, of course. Okay, so I'm on a, like, my anniversary trip. We're on a romantic anniversary trip. We're in love. Things are great. We're in the beautiful spot. And I can't get that song. <laughs> I can't get it out of my head when we're in the ocean. I can't get it if he's trying to make moves on me. It's the saddest You Broke My Heart song. Yeah. And it is like, it will not stop playing in my brain. Yep. So I, I mean, that's, it was really awkward. Well, she released awkward. two albums around the same time. She yeah. released Evermore, I think. Yeah. Ever, ever something. And, and that one. So yeah, Folklore um, was first. And then the other one followed up real quick. And they're. Both wonderful. Oh, yeah. She's just... But she I prefer one. her up-tempo style. I mean, I love these songs. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. But I could listen to, you know, That's What You Made Me Do. 
like yeah. all of that. Like I love her up tempo stuff. It just I, I no, love no, no. I love we her. all have to grow up. You don't have to, but the rest of us, you know, we had to move on to songs that actually, you know, about real things. Okay. <laughs> I was explaining to Casey, we heard some Alanis Morissette and he's like, who's this? And I was like, oh, honey, this is why Taylor Swift and Olivia Rodrigo have careers. Okay, This is who they owe that to because he doesn't know Jagged Little Bill. Why would he? Right. No, you know? of course. I know I, but guy, I was like, yeah, I know some people that said that said he didn't. He was like, I didn't. I never liked her music. And I thought, well, that's wow. I was very surprised by that. And he's like, you did. And I was like, I well, was clearly in, a Nazi. Right. I was like, I was. Yeah. In my 20s, and she was singing the heart of every 20-year-old girl in the country, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, in the world. Um, yeah. Anyway, well, that's great. I love all that. I love all that. We just started watching the rehearsal on Ooh. HB. Oh, did you start watching it? Did you watch it? Oh, we tried. That's oh my. Nate. What's yeah, yeah, name? yeah. Nathan. Nathan something or other. I forget. Oh, uh, I forget his last name. Nathan for you. He did on HBO. He is an odd dude. Um, Fielder, I think. Nathan Fielder. Nathan Fielder. That yeah. sounds good. Yeah. Um, we are obsessed with that show. Of course, it's no surprise to me that you did not enjoy it. Patrick and I Hate are it. obsessed. Nope. It Hate was it. like we couldn't wait to watch the next episode. It, Unwatchable. Oh, my God. No, it's not. It's so good. It's so tense. It's so weird. It's wonderful. The first three episodes are wonderful. We watched the fourth and I was like, meh. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see. I'll let you know about the rest of them. Of course we disagree. <laughs> I found it unnecessary. I found it cruel. Like, to me, it makes fun of the people that have said, oh, I'll be on this show. Oh, I, I don't, don't find it to be a positive experience for them. I find it <gasps> like, oh. I, like, I feel like they're going to have the same fate as kids who are like five and their parents are posting them on TikTok now and they don't know it. And then like when they're in high school, their friends are going to be like, look what you said when you were five and your parents showed your tushy and like, it's going to be bad news for those kids. I don't think so. Uh, that's how I feel for these people on the Nathan Fielder show. No, maybe I, I, maybe the lady well, who wants to have a baby, who's who's raising a baby, I mean, who's raising a baby like uh, a month at a time, right? Like it, like she for those. For, I it, didn't see it. Oh yeah. no! So she wants to try having children. So what they do is they give her an experience in her dream house in or rural Oregon, the way that she would imagine raising children, mm -hmm. and they bring infants in, like and trade them out. Because because kids can only work a few hours on a TV show, and right. she she so over the course of a month she's going to raise a kid from infancy to like eighteen. So they switch out the two year old for a three year old, and the three year old for a five year old, etc. So that like she they can, do on sitcoms when they're like, oh, this yeah. kid isn't cute. Let's let's age him up so he can be. <laughs> oh yeah, it is so yeah. trippy, and it's really trippy. But I I don't think that I don't think the people look bad. I think they what they go through they by rehearsing their worst fears is they come to this, these catharses that you go, oh my God, that is gorgeous. Like they, they actually, it is, it's beautiful what they come to. They come to their real truth by going through their own bullshit several times. They end up like breaking down and saying what's really on their mind and it's gorgeous. And you go, both times you go, oh my God, if you say that to your brother or if you say that to your friend, they will understand. It's, it, I think it's, he's doing these people a real service. I'm going to break you down and see how you... <laughs> yeah, to me, it reeks of that same culty thing in the vow. Like, you know, uh, what what do they call it when you like, you revisit something until it has no meaning? Oh, I forget and what that, that is, yeah. that is a fine therapeutic technique. I get it. But when you force it like that and you do it on TV in front of people, it feels culty and ugly. And I hated the rehearsal. Like, I couldn't have hated it more. Oh, I loved it. <laughs> Welcome to what for all surprise. those new listeners out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to let us know who you think is right. It is. It gets a little odd in, in episode four, though. I stand behind episodes one through three, though. I definitely stand behind it. <sighs> well, yeah, this. So this brings me to one of the most interesting topics in the Matthew Perry book called Friends, Lovers and the Big Ugly Thing. Did I get that right? Is it the big ugly thing or the big scary thing? I think it's probably the big ugly thing. I'll I'll, I'll look at it. You tell me and I'll, I'll look it okay. up. Okay. I'll have the research so, department. Sylvia. We have a new staff member, <laughs> Sylvia. Oh, great. Yeah. Oh, she's delightful. Oh, she um, drove a hard bargain for salary, but she is worth it. Worth every penny. So uh, this is Matthew Perry's story. We both listened to it, right? Or did you read it? Oh, no, no. I, I listened to it. It was... We listened to it. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So we knew it was going to be about his addiction, but the big, terrible thing. Friends, love the big, terrible thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's also about his career and his life. It's not just simply about his addiction. It's his, it's biographical. Yes. Autobiographical. So when I'll, I'll, I want to jump in at the part where he's in Hollywood, best friends with Hank Azaria, Craig Bierko, and a guy whose name I forget. They're all tooling around Hollywood. Mm -hmm, This mm -hmm. is what he considers paying his dues, which makes me hate him (laughs) as if I need more reason to hate Matthew Perry. Like, he considers spending six months not in limos like he really paid his dues. But the four of them were all trying to land a pilot and become actors. And some of them had more success immediately. And the, the, the story I found gripping about this phase of his life is that Craig Bierko, an actor whom I really like, um, gets offered Ugh, are you, see, Chandler well, Bing. Well, there we go. I do not enjoy Craig Bierko, but go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, he gets offered Chandler Bing <laughs> and the lead in a series. And he asks his friends, like, what should I do? I got offered these two leads or, you know, these two roles. Yes. And he takes the other show, yep. opening the role of Chandler Bing for Matthew Perry. Yep. And then, of course, the Bierko show bombs. And I, I don't even know if it aired. And he can't speak to Matthew Perry for a while because it's too hard for him that, like, Mm -hmm. he lived my destiny. And I was, that part really struck me. They they make amends and Bierko comes back to him and says, I am happy for you and I'm sorry I didn't handle that well. Yeah. Um, But (laughs) Matthew Perry hurts everyone around him. Like, I don't think he's got lasting friendships, you know, like throughout his life. I just found that that phase interesting and these Hollywood friendships. And I was wondering if you have any stories about anyone other than me. Go ahead. (laughs) Wait a second. That's the most interesting part of this book. No, no, no. Just no, no, no. We were talking about our friendship. You and me and how we disagree about everything and our friendship has survived. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh yeah, interesting that that friendship barely survived. Well, I thought that first of all, but they were, they were all working actors. Like they weren't, he wasn't just sitting around for six months waiting for a limousine. Like he had done pilots and he was, he had fully committed to this show about um, luggage handlers in space. And he was committed to that show. And then friends came along and he couldn't get an audition because they were like, sorry, dude, you've been snatched up by the luggage handler in space show. And he would kill them for months. And he helped everybody who read that script said, oh, my God, this is you, Matthew Perry, that you're you should play Chandler. But he couldn't. So he coached everyone because they were like, how would you say it? And mm-hmm. I mean, I thought that was so interesting. Everybody was like, yeah. this really is your part. Sorry about the Space Handler show, dude. And yeah. then and then when it finally came around and Craig Bierko said, no, it's only because he passed that he even got a chance to audition for it because the lady, Jamie Tarsus, who mm-hmm. he later ended up, I guess, boning. They were, di- yeah, boning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, she was like, is, are we sure about Matthew Perry? Is he really taken? And then they were like, nah, that show's not going to go anywhere. So then he actually got the chance to audition. And basically, he'd been auditioning for months, learning that part inside and out and thinking about that character for months and thinking, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine. So he secreted right. it. If anyone wants to go back to the, <laughs> one of the first episodes of Man Cave, it's really interesting. It's a great book and a wonderful movie, The Secret. Um, but uh, I loved, I loved that story. I had actually heard that story. Right. But did you, but I'm curious, like, having been in this town for 20 something years, you and me, like, are those friendships, is that something that you related to? Or you're like, no, my friendships are my friendships and no job is ever going to interfere. Or have you ever lost a friendship because of a job? Or like that? There are a lot of people who hate me because I took this spot on the podcast, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, The jealousy yeah. I deal with on a regular basis. They're like, you could yeah. talk to her again this week. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I don't. I mean, I certainly waver between, oh, God, you know, I, I wish I could have gotten that part. I really hated the the lady. Uh, uh, it's terrible. Michaela Watkins. Is that her name? Mm-hmm. Michaela mm-hmm. Watkins. I hated her for a while just because she got Saturday Night Live and I didn't. So I was like, right. boo, Michaela, boo. Um, right. But I don't think any of my close friends that I've I've had to deal with that. Have you? None of us have been successful enough to well, uh, yeah. upset you. <laughs> I think I've been I think I've been really happy for my friends for the most part. Like there's that initial like why them and not me sometimes. Of course, but there haven't been that specific like oh my god you took my job this is my job and you got it 
that I can remember. But you know me, I'm blissfully ignorant and I forget everything. (laughs) Well, I will never forget. I was a junior in college and we were doing a show and it came down to myself and my dear friend for the female lead in the musical. Yeah. And we left the callbacks and the callbacks were like, all right, now you sing with him. Now you sing with him. Now you dance. Now you dance. Very Ooh. chorus line. Mm-hmm. And she and I drove, I gave her a ride back up to her dorm. And I was like, it's so cool that it's down to you and me. And if I don't get it, I'm so happy you're going to get it. And she said, and I quote, if you get it, I'll never speak to you again. And got out of my car and closed the door. <gasps> oh, oh my God, you're joking. No. Wow. And what mm-hmm. happened? You're. She got it. Son of and a bitch. and our friendship was never the same because I was like, "What do you What do you mean? You know, I thought like one of the good guys is going to win here. One of us is going to get it." But she did not feel that way. Wow! How and awkward and horrible of her to say that out loud before she then yes. ended up getting it. Oh yeah. my god! Well, good for you for being so magnanimous about that. Like that's really. the point of my story. Thank you for understanding. Yeah, okay, you're a so wonderful person. Yes. What stuck out to you from this book? Well, like, what. I think the first thing that stuck out to me was, whoa, what happened to Matthew Perry? Because I started to listen to it at 1%, like normal time. And I was like, I can't. Speed, yeah. Yeah, he speaks so slowly. And I think it's because, and he tells you right up front, like, I was basically dead. I was in a coma. I've, my, I've, had, I've had these many surgeries. Like, he's a wreck. He's a shell of who he used to be. And he starts off yeah. telling that that he nearly died and his whole family was basically mourning him. And now he's back, but he doesn't sound super happy to be back. And it was really, um, so I had to listen to it at like 1.75 times. That that was his normal, what I know is Chandler's rhythm, right? Yeah, he gets real peppy. It was really interesting because on the one hand, there was this like, that's kind of a fun behind the scenes Hollywood story and him talking about like having a crush on Jennifer Aniston. But there's also this like, oh, it might have been wildly inappropriate all the you know but he was very i thought he was very honest about like him just sleeping with women to like fill the hole and and all that he was Hi-oh. honest Hey-o. but he was he was honest about his struggles but at the same time i what I, at the same time i thought oh you're not sober because you're so rich and famous you'll never really have a bottom hey no you're never really going <laughs> to you're never really going to suffer in the way that you need to suffer. You need to be abandoned. And, you know, it's like he was, the only thing that really would have been a bottom for him was to kill himself. And he hasn't quite done that yet. But every time he talked about getting sober, it was like, he just didn't have that. He never had that click of, I'm going to do this for me. It was Mm -hmm. always like, I'm still suffering so much. Like he never got that sobriety could be pleasant. He never let himself get far enough into it that he could enjoy the fruits. And and there's the other thing. He also, every time, gets into the ego of like, well, I went into a sober living house and immediately started helping everyone around me get sober, which is a ridiculous thing when you're like, dude, you're, you're, you can't help people. You're, you need to help yourself. <laughs> like, you're well, more into the prestige of I'm going to save other people as opposed to actually being in your sobriety. And I don't, for one second, believe he, believe he cares about anybody but himself. I think he comes across as completely self-involved. And and then like at the I didn't catch him saying he was helping a lot of people until the very end of the book when he's like, of course, all that matters is helping people. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you helped no one through, you know, this book yeah. spans 50 years and you cared about no one. Yeah. At, or couldn't get out of your own way to care about someone. Yeah. And now yeah. you're claiming you love helping people get sober. I don't. I, he does not seem genuine to me. Well, he does talk about that the whole way through. But I think I think it's just I, what I think about him is that he's in a lot of pain. That was what yes. I really took away from it. It's like, wow, I I have known a lot of people struggling to get sober and who, you know, addicts. And that kind of he just did not seem over it. He w- was not able to find peace. He was hurting all the time. He was either hurting because he was in mental and emotional pain or he was hurting because he was in physical pain because of the drugs and the stuff Mm -hmm. he was doing and the surgeries, Mm. Mm -hmm. you know, or he was hurting because he was detoxing from those drugs that were trying to, you know, it's like he just was always in chronic, horrible, mental, emotional, physical pain. And you go, well, of course you're self-involved if that's happening. I mean, 
I feel right. bad for him that he never... Now, granted, not every rich, famous person ends up, you know, treating people the way he did and constantly mm-hmm. self-involved. There are people that have families and lives. and But I really... He just, you know, the, even the way he told his stories, now he did apologize to people, which I thought, you know, that's good. But there was always even it, still a like, I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't for I was in so much pain. You know, he never really was like solid about his amends and his like, I made a mistake and I'm wrong and I'm fixing that. Right. And I thought it was interesting because for somebody who charmed America and the universe for Mm. 20 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, really charmed us. I think that Chandler Bing is charming as hell. Matthew Perry, in his heyday on talk shows, I was so not smitten like in a sexy way, but just like, wow, he's funny and he's quick and he's charming. Um, This book had no charm. He he let down that persona, I thought. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed by that. Like, as a person who... I write my diary just in case I die and people read it. Like I put jokes in my journals and I'm self-deprecating and hilarious because I want everyone to think, oh, yeah, I'm oh, not so on. good at like letting that go. You really have a journal? No, but oh, when I've oh, done it, okay, when gotcha. I've done my artist's way, uh, <laughs> when I've ever taken the time to to write. Yeah. It has never been just you for me, right. just me. It's never been in a vacuum. It has oh, always wow. been somebody will find this and read this. So it better be hilarious. Oh, my God. And, and I admire that Matthew Perry didn't do that. He did not try to charm his way out of how ugly he is. So we really got this ugly person, you know, and it's yeah. um, he, a very dark, a very unhappy, ugly person in a lot of pain. I'm not discounting that he was in tremendous pain yeah. and is. Yeah. In tremendous pain. It's really, I mean, it's it's shocking. And it, but it is one of those things that you go, wow. I mean, wow. If you don't have a handle on your addiction and then you just have no one ever to tell you no ever because you're mm-hmm. one of the most famous people in the world with unlimited funds. I mean, mm-hmm. I just don't know what makes and and you know, he kept saying he wanted a relationship, but there was even nothing really there to lose because he couldn't really connect with anybody. And even that is a little bit like his own psychoanalysis of that was even like, well, the pain from my mother and the pain from my father. And I'm a little bit like, or you've just been half dead your whole existence because you have been numbing yourself with drugs and alcohol. Like it was so, you know, it's, there was always this like, because I've been trying to get back into mommy's arms. And I'm like, no, no. At some point, you got to let that go. Like, mm-hmm. you have to have that turn where you go, it's just me in life. There's nothing else. This is just what I do today. And it just never, he, even in his sobriety, I think he's still taking those like, well, just so I don't feel the pain of that detox, I still got to take those drugs several times a day. Mm-hmm. And it's just right. a, anyway. Yeah. And that, he, uh, yeah. Yeah. Also, he, he acknowledges like that, he has all the money in the world mm-hmm. and he's like, I'm writing this overlooking from my mansion. I'm privileged I, and I'm still not happy. And I'm here to tell you that all the success in yes. the money, it doesn't make you well. It doesn't make you happy. Yeah. And, and I'm glad he could say that. It affirmed, it reaffirmed my theory when I, when I have friends, you and I've talked about this many times, who are struggling and they want more and uh. they want more success or more, you know, I want that promotion at work and I want to be made partner and I want this and I want this. We've like talked about it friends. because I've been the one saying these things. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, like I and I'm giving the example, I want to be made partner to try to hide your identity. <laughs> I want to be Jennifer Aniston. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're Jennifer Aniston, you want to be Julia Roberts. Yes, a thousand percent. And when you're percent. Julia Roberts, you want to be Meryl Streep. Yes. And when you're Meryl Streep, you want to be Olivia Coleman. And you're never yes. happy and you're never getting what you think you deserve. Yeah. And it's it's never ending. So you have to find peace with where you are. Yes. And it's, this business makes it really hard. But all he wanted was fame and success. And he got it. And he wanted to be respected for his talent. And he got it. And he wanted to be, he was the number one movie with a whole nine yards Mm -hmm. and simultaneously the number one show with friends. And he got it all. And he, none of it made him happy and pissed it all away. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's because he's sick. He's a very sick, sick person. Yeah, I really. Um, and it's hard to re- to listen to. Well, it was also interesting because it's the first time that I even thought like 
I guess I didn't realize, I knew he was sick during the show. It made sense, right? You don't just become an addict in season three. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was like, it really made me feel for his cast members, like how mm-hmm. well they hid, you know, they hid his sickness and how, mm-hmm. but also on the flip side, as he was talking about how they, you know, they took a little break and they made, they waited until he got better and how supportive they all were of him and how, you know, he was very sorry that he, you know, caused anybody any pain. But I was like, oh, my God. Like, these people have all rung the bell of the thing that, you know, if you want to be on television, right, if you're a comedy person, they rang the bell. I still don't know if there's a show, maybe except Seinfeld, right, but that's as successful as Friends. Isn't it arguably the most successful comedy of all time? Yeah. Right? So to be in that space where you are with that show and the magic that they all agree it was the most magic time they've ever had to have one person screwing with it like that to to have it be like oh my god oh my god what are we going to do now they right you know they i they could have probably moved on done the show without him like you know a very special friends episode right but like oh my god he played this guy named Sandy on family ties who died in a car accident and oh yeah he talks was, about or that or wait no 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 Sandy was on um, uh, Growing Pains. Yeah. It was Growing Pains, where he died. I don't remember, but I, he, I remember him I swear, about and, one of them. <laughs> and Tracy Gold cried because he died. Um, but, uh, um, no, I, but it's not just the five cast members. And we know they all knew, and they covered for him, and they Aniston confronted him at one point, and that's all laid out in the book. What what you don't think, what what I he didn't think about, I guess, is like, Everyone who works on that show, hundreds and hundreds yeah. of people, their livelihood depends on him just showing up in a sober enough state to complete his day's work. Oh, my God. Yeah. And to, like, oh. if he can't do that, Jennifer Aniston's going to be fine. She's going to be a movie star. Yeah. But what about the yeah. key grip? What about these other people whose lives depend on him? Well, it's really it, interesting because he has that weird thing where, you know, he could get any he got so many chances. He mm-hmm. got so many chances. Studio sure 54 did. and uh, going, what is it? Going no, um, studio- Sunset. You mean Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip. Oh, Studio 60. Okay, the one about Saturday yeah. Night Live. What was Studio yeah, 54? Which I liked. That's a club in oh. New York that where people did cocaine in the 70s and 80s well, in Warhol. you know, I've just, I have a, hi- I have a history. It's hard to let go. You spent too much time there. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. Definitely. Yeah. Um, no, I was at the limelight. No, I never went to the limelight. Anyway, um, so that was interesting. And then the growing on or go- going on, the one about the th- therapy, and then he had a sports writer. Show. Like, he had so many chances. Mr. Sunshine, I watched all of these. Yeah. He's a talented, funny guy. Yeah, but... And I didn't know about all of this back... I mean, but, you would hear stories about like, oh, he's in rehab for back pain pills. Right, You know, like yeah. you would hear that. But you didn't know he was killing himself But he was all, never, all these years. He was never quite... I mean, I could... I. Personally, I mean, I don't know, maybe who knows what you actually think, right? You hear things and then you go, oh, yeah, he looks like he's on drugs. So maybe it was just that there was he was always in the news in that way. I did Mm -hmm. hear horror stories from the set of The Odd Couple. That is one. And he just I don't think he said much about that, except he was like, I just want to take a whole chapter to apologize to every single person who worked on that show and everyone I came in contact with. Because I I mean, I don't know the specifics. I had a friend that worked on it and he was horrible to her. Um, but mm. I don't, it didn't stop at her. I think he was just really, he must have been really spiraling out of control again. Well, that was when he was actually dying. Like his body was shutting oh, down and, you know, I mean, because right. that was only like four or five years ago, the odd couple. Yeah. That's and that right. was right before he was like, and then I was in a coma and then my, well, I forget right. what happened. His colon exploded or yeah, like all yeah. this his asshole terrible blew stuff right happened. up, blew right up. Yeah. It's really, that is the thing. I, I mean, he's very funny. I will say he's not charming. He doesn't sugarcoat anything. And I, I agree with you. I think that's very brave. Um, and he is funny throughout. Like he he says things, you know, he talks about his exploding colon. Pretty, pretty funny. He does make some good jokes. He talks about his mm-hmm. play that he writes in London and how mm-hmm. that goes. And he's very frank about how no one enjoys it. Like he, so he's very, um, it, it it is very funny, but it is, I, and I found it really interesting. And I and I, it was very Schadenfreude, like where you go, mm-hmm. wow. If I ever thought that I wanted to be famous, then that would fix anything. 
this story certainly makes me think differently. It makes me appreciate. Wait, Schadenfreude is when you wish ill on someone else because it makes you feel better about you. No, it's like if you hear a sad story about someone else, it makes you feel good. You know, like uh, that girl who okay. said I should be um, cast in the mm-hmm. role and you shouldn't. Like if we found out that she broke her ankle, we'd be like, oh, but it would feel a little good <laughs> because like, oh, she'll never dance again. Oh, yeah. Oh, that would be good. <laughs> would have been better if it happened the week before the show and I got the part. Dang it. You should. You deserved that role. You deserved um, it. I, and now that I'm too old for it, I'll do it in miscast. Oh, yeah. <laughs> miscast. You're not, old, you're not too old. Oh, miscast. Yes, coming up. The Mandy's together again on stage. Oh, God. Sunday, January 22nd. So North excited. Hollywood at the Federal. Get your tickets at eventbrite.com. Yes. I'm so excited. We will be together again. It's going to be a good show. I know. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. There's my my Love it. plug. Good plug. Um. We can't talk about the book without talking about the Keanu Reeves drama. Are you aware of the drama that ensued from Keanu Reeves? Uh, Like what, after the book or something that happened? No. So Matthew Perry at one point is talking about like what a beast addiction is and how it takes too many people too soon. It takes visionaries like Heath Ledger and River Phoenix, yet Keanu Reeves still walks among us. And then he says again later in the book, like, oh. isn't that a kicker? Reminder, Keanu Reeves is still alive. Oh, that's not cool. It was so insulting and random. And he had to, Keanu Reeves, I guess, came out and was like, ah, uh, I didn't realize he had a problem with me. Like, that makes no sense. And, but people were outraged because it's a very mean spirited thing to say. Like, he should have died instead of River Phoenix. That's a, you know, yeah, awful thing to say. It and is. Matthew Perry had to say, I'm sorry, I was trying to make a joke. Yes. So I picked a random name yeah. and I should have just used my own name. And but here's the thing. That's not totally. Look, yeah, it was a mean joke. OK, but Keanu Reeves has a bit of an Ishtar thing going on. He does. <laughs> he does. Ishtar is actually a pretty great movie. But for years, every I, I liked it. It was pretty good. I've like, never seen it, but uh, I you okay. hear it's like the biggest bomb because yes. it was two huge stars yes. and all of that. Right? It was a huge dump of a failure. And uh-huh. so I watched it to see what was so awful about it. And I was like, this is actually pretty good. So Ishtar is actually a pretty good movie, but everybody's like, ugh, Ishtar. Like for years, it was the butt of every right. bad movie joke. Keanu Reeves, you know, Bill and Ted and like, I don't know, Point Break. I don't know his, his whole... Now, maybe this... Before The Matrix, before he maybe did other things. Look, he was not ever really that great of an actor. He's done some good work, but he he kind of had this reputation of like not being a super genius is what I'm going to say. He was good looking, right? Totally yes. fine. Yes. But to say he should be dead instead of somebody more talented... Right. ...is appalling. You could just say like, oh, I thought he had no talent and I wouldn't take a, you know, no, no, no. Fun, I, I, but. I know. But like he was trying to compare visionaries that, you know, I, it's not a yeah. good joke, but I get the joke is what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, as do I. It was just uncomfortable and mean spirited well, and course. unnecessary. Well, did you uh, look, tell Keanu to come over for dinner and we'll we'll talk him through it. The thing is, he seems like he would. Yeah. Sure. He seems like the kind, like, I, I just saw a story where, like, he crashed a wedding because he, somebody in the lobby said, oh, my God, you're Keanu Reeves, come to the wedding, and he did. Like, he <laughs> seems like a nice guy. Oh, my God. That's great. Yeah. Did you have any other, like, things you wanted to talk about? About? In terms of the book, major topics? No, not really. I mean, it was, uh, it was really interesting to hear about all his girlfriends. That was fascinating to me, just in a complete, like that was just uh, that was really interesting to me. <laughs> he's he's just so gross to me. But uh, yes, w- one tidbit he gave, um, like a, a a criminal hack, if you will, that he used to go to open houses and go into the pill cabinets and steal everybody's prescription medications. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So heads up, anybody selling your house, <laughs> hide. Your medications. Put them in a lockbox. Yes. Right? That is a very good tip. Yes. I 
I'd never, I mean, that's genius stuff to me. I would never think of that. And I like planning crimes, but I, I would never do that. Once so, again, just proving you are not a drug addict. Yes. <laughs> We're working on you. I know. Um, yeah. All right. Okay. Shall we give it some manned jobs so that we can play a game? Yeah. Um, you know, the truth is, even though, well, I feel for the guy and I thought it was pretty brave and I thought it was interesting enough because he's such an icon. So to be honest, I would give it like four. I mean, I ripped through it. It's trashy, but like I ripped through it. And I and at the end of the day, while I don't believe for a second he's going to stay sober, uh, I felt for him. I did. I really was sorry. Sorry that he is dealing yeah. with this horrible addiction. So, yeah, four. It, yeah, it four. it's sad because you you, uh, you distinctly get the the feeling that he is not going to stay sober. And that's sad. You want to yeah. believe like he's so maybe sick. he really can do it now. He's so sick. Yeah. Um, How about I, you? I would give it like three. Yeah. I I did race through it. It's an easy listen yes. or read, but it's also not really well written. And he jumps around in time so much that you're like, oh, oh wait, I thought you were already in rehab. Oh, God, yes. No, and you're right. And then he tells stories that's like, I feel like they're almost like he accidentally tells the same story. You're right. He does. Two or three times. He but does. different stories because he jumps back and forth. So it's not very well written. I have a feeling yet again, no one could say no. Oh, yeah. Probably publishers were like, uh, hey, Matthew, could you change this around? And he was like, no. <laughs> it's fine. And they were like, okay, you're Matthew Perry. So three and a half. You're right. I um, forgot about it's that. It's uncomfortable. I was actually marveling at that. I was like, he already told this story in the book. You're right. Yeah. He repeats a couple stories. <laughs> but it's hard to tell if they're repeats or if just yeah, he had experiences that were like, you know, yeah, deja vu experiences. Yeah. Well, it's hard a, to know. It's a, it's a mess in there. <laughs> Yeah, I can't imagine yeah. after all those uppers and downers and all those chemicals. Like he sounds like he's his brain is going. He sounds like he's yes. he's not very yes. Yeah. He he sounds it's brain damaged. Great. Yes, unfortunately, it is unfortunate. Oh well, um, on to lighter things. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, yes. So happy New Year, everybody. Yeah, because this this is going to drop in the Ooh. new year. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I well, I was going to get to our business. Let's do it. Get to the business. Yeah. The Man Cave is a production of True Story FM Engineering by Pete Wright, music by Ian Post. And we need reviews on uh, Apple Podcasts. Yeah. And uh, we have a new one. Oh. From TKP1010. Uh, this person said a friend told me to check it out. And I love them. I get great recs for new movies and shows. Can't believe they always disagree, but they make me laugh every time. So thank you, TKP1010. We need reviews, guys. Five stars. And you'll get a shout out. You can ask us questions. You can make suggestions of what we should review. And yes. we, and we appreciate it. We have a nice, healthy group chat going in the Discord, too. Just like a, a group chat situation. Go to mancave.com slash Discord. There's a channel that's for fandies only. Fandies, uh, you know, you can become a fandy by paying five bucks a month and be a member and support the show. Uh, and then we have a an all listener channel as well and uh it's really we have a we have some good dialogue going on in there yes yeah. picture and yeah. if you become a fandy yes. you get a birthday message from the mandies yep you get pre-show fun yep that the the regular public is not hearing our pre-show talk yeah so yeah we had i would recommend everybody become a fandy for that alone we dropped a bonus episode yep. during the break for only for fandies. So if you become a fandy, you can listen to all that fun stuff. Yes, it's great. And I just made a big purchase for the holidays of some nice Mand Cave merch. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I got the, uh, you know, the title game that we did. I got yes, a, I got yes. a t-shirt with the title game. I got wow. my Aunt Myrna. Oh, I, well, this she, it'll be past the holiday. I, I got my past Aunt Myrna. Holidays, she's already nice, gotten it. She's a huge fan. So I got her a Mand Cave t-shirt. And uh, anyway, mm -hmm. there's lots of really fun merch. So go check it out uh, at mancave.com slash merch. All right. I, 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 yeah, there we go. Business done. I mean, do you have any New Year's resolutions? Is there anything that you're like, or is that what your game is? No. Okay. Nothing? Do you ever do New Year's resolutions? No, I'm fine the way I am. <laughs> That's always... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> your book about your struggles is going to be like a chapter. And a it's, chapter? It's going to be like nah, it's gonna a, be paragraph. a paragraph. And it's going to be that story yeah. that you told earlier about the, about your friend who was like, I'll never speak to you again if, I, if you get yep. that part. Oh. Uh, do you want to tell your New Year's resolutions? Because if you do, we will follow up on them and you'll have to admit that you have not kept them. I <laughs> am going to follow up on one of them. I got that book, How to Break Up with Your Phone. I don't know if I talked about that okay. before. and Not on the podcast. Well, there you go. I got How to Break Up with Your Phone. And my sister and I are going to do the How to Break Up with Your Phone Detox 30-Day Program. And I will let you know how that goes. You are already difficult to reach, so I do not approve. <laughs> but... I, I'll, I'll text and your kids don't have a phone for me to get to. So I'm going to be texting Patrick and going, tell Mandy to call me. I'm only doing right this. Now. I'm trying to force your hand to move in. There's some houses for sale on the street. Oh, yeah. I just want oh. you to like, wouldn't it be great if we were neighbors? I think we should make that happen. The, I'll move into that crack den across the street. <laughs> <laughs> and Patrick will continue to paint the fence for me. <laughs> That's true. He would fix it up for you. Oh, God. Yes. All right. So this book was called Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing. But we struggled to remember the title of it. Yes. And it made me think, autobiography titles. Hmm. Oh, There's boy. something there. <laughs> so I am going to tell you the title of an autobiography. And I'm going to have an airplane pass right over my head. And I'm going to give you multiple choice. And you have to tell me whose autobiography it is. Well, an airplane passed over my head. Scully. <laughs> Sully. <laughs> oh, Sully. Who's Scully? Oh, Scully's the one from, hey, you know what? That character in um, It's Not Stranger Things. You know, the one Jillian Anderson. X-Files. Yeah, yeah. That'd be her character's autobiography. Okay. Or we could just play this game where you try to tell me something and I have to fill in every other word for you. <laughs> That's just our regular conversation. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Yeah. The name of the book is I Can't Wait Until Tomorrow Because I Get Better Looking Every Day. Okay. The choices for the author are <laughs> Giselle Bunchen. Oh, my God. Joe Namath or Grumpy Cat. <laughs> Joe Namath. Yes. <laughs> That's okay, that one was easy. That one was easy. That was okay. a good title. Okay. The, yeah, I know. The next one is Kiss and Makeup. Okay. Was that written by Angelina Steven Jolie. Tyler? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Lisa Rinna? Yeah. Or Gene Simmons? Gene Simmons. Yes. Although I like the Lisa Rinna pitch. Thank you. <laughs> two for two. I'm Still Hungry. Was that written by John Candy? <laughs> Carney Wilson? Or Emeril Lagasse? <laughs> Carney Wilson. Yes. Three for three. I really like autobiographies. <laughs> Wishful Drinking. Do you know who that is? Oh, yeah. Carrie Fisher. Yeah. I read that But my one. other choices were Russell Brand and W.C. Fields. Oh, those are I was good. proud of my... Yeah. <laughs> I really oh. just like making stuff up. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Okay. Getting It Through My Thick Skull. Was that written by <laughs> James Carville, mm -hmm. Rodney Dangerfield, oh. or Mary Jo Buttafuoco? <laughs> Oh, God, that's actually really tough. I'm going to say Rodney Dangerfield. That was written by Mary Jo Bonifuco. You're joking. Isn't that hilarious? Oh, my God, that is hilarious. Wow. Yeah. Okay. All right. The next one. Yeah. Out of Sync. Was that written by <laughs> Lance Bass, <laughs> Ashley Simpson, or Millie Vanilli? I'm going to say Millie Vanilli. Come on. No, it's Lance Bass. Yes. Yeah, but that's Millie Vanilli. That's but a I fun came up pitch. with Ashley Simpson and Millie Vanilli. Yes, it's so I just, it's, oh it's god, I'm so self they lip sync. It's so brilliant. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Does Lance the Bass noise it, out of sync? Yeah. Yes. Does the noise in my head bother you? <laughs> Was that written by Stephen Wright, Stephen Tyler, or Stephen Merchant? Oh, uh, that's a good one. That is a really good one. Yeah, it's between Stephen Merchant or Stephen Wright. I'm going to say Stephen Wright. I don't know if comedians were really doing books. Shit. It's it's one of those guys. Does the noise in my head bother you? I don't think it's Stephen Tyler. He's a rock star. Hmm. Wow, you this is a good one. 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Let's go with, I'm going to say Stephen Merchant. It is Steven Tyler. Wait, what? Yes. That's such a clever. Does the noise in my head bother you? That's such a clever title for a rock star. Well, huh? Okay. That, that's why I picked two comedians. Okay. The next title. I thought it would nerd. be something like the arrow of my ways or something, you know, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next title is Nerd Do Well. <laughs> Was that written by Stephen Merchant? Oh. Simon Pegg? Or Jaleel White. Well, geez. I don't know. Stephen Merchant. Do, I don't know who Do Jaleel you know who White Jaleel White is? No. Urkel. Oh. Urkel from The Family Matters or from the whatever the show is. Yeah. Okay. Uh well, Urkel? I'll guess I'll, say, I'll guess Urkel. I yeah, I guess I misled you because it's Simon Pegg. Oh. Wait, Stephen is... Merchant is a lazy mother effer who has not written a book, apparently. Because I just put <laughs> him in just there keep twice. Putting him in there. I love him. Wait, I, I love him too, but he isn't he that actor that's sort of like an ostrich? Like, doesn't he? Yes. Also, yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's very tall and bug eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Really okay. funny, dry. Well, he needs he to should write a book. Hopefully by next year he will. Um, who's yes. Simon Pegg? Why can't I think of who that is? Oh, uh, like Shaun of the Dead and oh, Hot Fuzz and yes. Mission Impossible movies. And yeah. I was thinking of like Simon Cowell, who's like a, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The last one is. Yes. Don't hassle the Hoff. Was that written by David Hasselhoff, <laughs> Madeline Albright, or Alf? Madeline Albright, <laughs> obviously. No, yeah. David had Knight Rider. Oh, that's great. Now I'll give Mandy. You, yeah, you did very, very well on this game. Thank you. It's something I'm very passionate about. Do you happen to know the title of my working autobiography? Uh, uh Mandy's my best friend. <laughs> Close. No, um, Gentle Little Circles. Huh. <laughs> I didn't know that. Is that the book you're writing? No, it's a wor- it's always a working title of any I am I am writing something. It's not an autobiography. But um oh. but it it is that's the working title of it because I just think it's funny. You know, because yes. gentle little circles as opposed to up and down. You know. The circles. Yeah. But there's a life yeah. also goes in circles. You know, it's a cute little. Anyway, is that, I don't well, think it's when you pass. did a one woman show, you called it kicked in the head. So that was good. <laughs> yes. Oh, great. OK, um, well, that was very All right. Fun. What do you got for me? OK, well, um, it's not much of a departure, except I think it's I hope it's a more lighthearted. I actually don't know anything about it, but a fandy uh, requested it. And I okay. so want to see it. So you and I are going to watch on Netflix, Stuts. It is a documentary about Jonah Hill's therapist. And that's all I know about it. Oh, okay. And I've heard, I've had, I had like two people go, oh my God, have you seen Stuts? And then a uh, listener, Megan, asked On us. the Discord, mm-hmm. listener Megan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So we got we got an assignment, and I'm very excited. Is that excited a series or? Oh, you know, I think it's a uh, movie. I think it's a one off. Okay, that would be good. Yeah, it's a documentary right. movie. Great. Um, yeah, Great. and I think Joni Hill directed it. So it'll be really fun to dig into, you know, and more you know. psychoanalysis. Yeah, we're so year. good at that. Like, we know people. So, yay. All right. All right. Well, I'll see you. I'll see you next week then. Glad to be back. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.